All right, this is for course three. We are looking at some of our review questions for test 17. So we're looking at um, specifically like one through 85, really looking at those ending questions as well. All right, so I'll just go through these questions so you can see the process, but also um, see the answers as well. So Jackson has 12 blue cards, 12 yellow, 12 red, and 12 green cards. Takes one card, keeps it, and then takes another. What's the probability of him grabbing a yellow card and then another yellow card? Well, when I look at this, I see that I have, uh, I have four sets of 12 cards, so 48 total. So I know that my beginning probability is going to be out of 48 for sure. And then I say, well, the probability of getting that first yellow card is 12 out of 48. But it tells me that once I grab one of those, I keep it, which means when I go back for another yellow card, there's only 47 cards in the, in the pile, and only 11 of them are yellow cards now since I kept that first yellow card. So some simplification can happen here, and then I can get my final answer once I multiply 4 and 47, 1 and 11, so I get 11 out of 188. Okay, so this is our dependent probability. Continuing on, we have um, this person buying a dress and saving $30 because of a 20% discount. How much did she pay for the item? Well, this is actually a really good one to set up a table. Lots of ways to do it. But I would say that we have our ratio here, an actual count. And then I can say, well, I have my original price Okay, I have my discount and then I have my new price. You can order those however you want, but the ratio means that the original price is 100% because that's the original cost. My discount was 20%, which means that my new price must have been 80%. We can go over to the actual count and put in our amount for the dollars to say that 20% discount is $30. And we need to decide which one we care about. Do I care about the original price or do I care about the new price? And I would say, because I'm looking for how much did she pay for the item, I'm looking at this 80% here. So I can set up a ratio um, or a proportion. 20 over 80 equals 30 over X. I can simplify a bunch here before I actually look at this. And then I would probably cross multiply to get 120 equals X which means that she actually paid $120 for that dress after the discount. So if we wanted to continue filling this in, I would say $120 here. So the original cost must have been $150. All right, question number three. If an image is increased by 80%, what is the area increased by? Okay. So we have a whole list of things that we can learn from this. The first being, if I have an 80% increase, that means that if I have this um, original box over here, that's 100%. I add 80 to it, so my new box, this bigger one, must be 180% of the original. We care about that because that 180% of the original tells me my perimeter skill factor, saying from this one to this one, I multiply by something, and that's just the decimal form of the percent 1.8. Okay, so whenever I do this, I would be multiplying by 1.8 on those sides to get the new box. From there, our area scale factor, like we've seen before, I am going to square that perimeter scale factor. Jack actually gives me 3.24, 3.24. Well, going backwards, I know that if I have a scale factor, that tells me my percent of the original. Just like this perimeter scale factor gave me 180% of the original, 3.24 gives me 324% of the original. Which means if this box, this first box was 100% as far as area, I had to add on top of it 224% in order to get this new one. So I would say my percent increase is 224%. Coming from that perimeter scale factor, squaring it, and then going back to our percentages. Okay. 
we are given this um, box split up into a bunch of different things and we want to find the lengths of BY, AZ, and AB. Well, the first one that we look at, um, I would say is probably AB to figure out this length in here. And we would say if the total length down here is 15 inches, six and six takes up 12 of those inches. So I have three inches left for AB. So AB is three inches. Don't forget your units. And then I look, I'll probably say BY next because it looks like I have more information. Um, I have six inches by eight inches. This is our right triangle since it's a rectangle. So six, eight, and 10 inches. That's either with the Pythagorean theorem or with our um, triples, our Pythagorean, Pythagorean triples. So BY is 10 inches. And then we look at AZ. In this one, it ends up that this is six inches and this is also eight inches. So this is still 10 inches. It won't always be the same but in this one, it ended up being the same. So AZ equals 10 inches. From there, we can use this as well in order to get the area of ABYZ, which is a trapezoid. So I use the formula B1, so base one plus base two. We're gonna multiply by the height and divide by two. So I plug in what I know, and I know a lot of things based on what I learned in the last one. We said this was three inches. So that's my base one. So three plus base two is 15. The height, even though I don't see it in here, the height is just the same as my outside rectangle of eight. And then I'll divide by two, which means that I have 18 times eight divided by two. I would probably go ahead and do 18 divided by two is nine times eight is of course 72 inches squared, since we're talking about area. Okay, formula for the sequence is a sub n equals n cubed plus two. What's the sixth term of the sequence? Well, it gives us a bunch of different first terms. This is the first one, second one, third one, fourth one. Remember that n is the position, so one, two, three, or four. So if I just check to make sure the sequence works, a sub one should give me three. So I plug it in and I say one cubed plus two is, yes, three. So a sub two should give me 10. Two cubed plus two is eight plus two, so 10. So it works. Three will give me 29, four will give me 66. And when I look at the sixth term of the sequence, a sub six equals six cubed plus two. Six cubed is 216, so plus two is 218. So remember, if you're looking for a specific term in the sequence, plug in that number for n. All right, continuing on. How much money is 33 and a third percent of $96? Well, based on our lesson of choosing the correct rational number, I probably wouldn't keep it as a percent or as a decimal. I would turn 33 and a third into one third. That's our fraction form of that percent. Of means multiplication, and then $96, okay? So a third of $96, I would just divide by three and get $32. Okay, what's the volume of the cylinder? Well, remember that volume, whenever we do volume, I am looking for the area of the base, big B, times the height. Well, area of the base in this case is pi, r squared, and we'll multiply that by height. So it doesn't say keep pi as pi, so I'm going to use 3.14 times our radius squared. Well, that's 4 squared, and then I'm going to multiply by the height of 15. And so I multiply all that out, 3.14 times 16 times 15. Hopefully, using um, all of the skills that you know, you got an answer of 753.6 feet, and since we're in volume, we're in feet cubed. Make sure that you check that out. Doesn't matter which order you multiply in. I would probably do 16 times 15 and then multiply by 3.14. Ends up being less decimals to keep track of. All right, so same cylinder, but we are looking for lateral surface area. Now, if I just wanted surface area, I would say two times the area of the base plus the perimeter times the height but I just want lateral surface area, which means I don't want the area of the base. I just want perimeter times height. 
Now the base of this is a circle, just like our volume one. So I would say the perimeter of a circle is the circumference. So like pi times diameter, then we'll multiply by height. So once again, I'm going to use 3.14, diameter of 8, height of 15. And so when you multiply all of that out, get 376.8 square feet, since we're looking at surface area, feet squared. All right, continuing on. Sketch the graph of the equation. 4x plus 3y equals 12. This is a little reminder of how we do this. This is in standard form right here. So I would make a table to find my intercepts. I would say that when I plug in y as 0, I find that x is 3. When I plug in x as 0, y is 4. Okay, and I'll give you another example here in a second just like it. But when I go to graph these, I just have to graph the points that I have here. So 3 comma 0, that's 3 on the x, 0 on the y, so right there. And then 0 comma 4, I'm going 0 right or left since x is 0, but up 4. And so I have my two intercepts, and then there's my line. Let's say I have this graph of like 2x plus y equals 6, just to show this again. Well, standard form, plug in x as 0 and y as 0. So if x is 0. 2 times 0 plus y equals 6. That cancels out, so y equals 6. And then I plug in y as 0, so 2x plus y equals 6. Oops. So that's going to be a 0 now, cancels out. So 2x equals 6, so x must be 3. And I can plot those on my graph. 0, 6 is going to be up here. 3, 0 is still going to be actually right on that spot, same spot, just by coincidence. And then we can make my graph. Okay, standard form uses those intercepts really well. All right, solve the equation for A. Well, I'm given this equation, and A is definitely not by itself. It's being bothered by B through multiplication, bothered by D through subtraction. Well, just like solving any equation, I need to do PEMDAS backwards, which means I need to get rid of this minus D first. So in order to get rid of the minus D, I need to add D to each side. Now, Y and D are not the same, so they're not like terms, so I just say Y plus D equals AB. Getting closer, but it's still being multiplied by B. So the opposite of multiplying by B is dividing by B. Now I divided the entire right side by b, so I have to divide the entire left side by b. So I can say my final answer is a equals y plus d, all that divided by b. Okay, and continuing, solving graph on the number line. Solving an inequality means that I need to get x by itself, just like an equation, gotta get our variable by itself. So the first thing that's bothering it is this 13. Now this is a positive 13. Even though I see a subtraction sign here, it's actually connected to the x. This is a positive 13, so I need to subtract 13 from each side. And I get, canceled out there, negative x is less than or equal to 3. But x is not quite alone. We actually have a negative 1 multiplied outside of there, so I have to divide by a negative 1 to get rid of it. But based on our rules of inequalities, if I'm dividing or multiplying by a negative number, I switch the sign. So I get x, I get negative 3, and then this less than or equal sign becomes a greater than or equal to because I divide it by a negative. So that's my answer as far as my solution, but I have to graph it on a number line. Both things are necessary. And so I have my negative 3, I'll put a couple more on here, negative 2 and negative 4. A less, or sorry, a greater than or equal to sign means a closed dot since I'm equal to negative 3. And then since I want the ones that are greater than it, I want all the ones to the right. All right, keep going through these. I'm um, trying to get done pretty quickly here. Sarah's faucet pours water at a rate of 72 gallons per hour. Convert gallons per hour to quarts per minute using two unit multipliers. So I always start with my information as a fraction, 72 gallons in one hour. Then I'm going to use two unit multipliers. 
because I need to change the gallons to quarts and I need to change, change the hours to minutes. I'll start with the gallons. Well, since gallons is on the top, I need to put gallons on the bottom here to cancel them out. And I'm changing to quarts. So the conversion from gallons to quarts is one gallon is four quarts. And then I change the hours. Hours is on the bottom, so it needs to go on the top now to cancel out. And I'm going to minutes. So one hour is 60 minutes. Okay, now all I have to do is multiply 72 times 4. We have quarts on the top and 1 times 1 times 60 minutes. And I just have to simplify. 72 times 4 divided by 60 ends up coming out to 4.8 quarts per minute. All right. Let's continue on. So with this next one, oops, I get x plus 0.2x equals 3.6. Now it's really tempting to want to do something with this plus 0.2x, like subtract it from each side. But actually, we want to combine it with this other x. It's like having 1x plus 0.2x's. If I add all of those up, I get 1.2x. Since those are like terms, I can add them up, and only the coefficients, those numbers out front, changes. And now, all I have to do is one more step. Since I've multiplied by 1.2, I divide by 1.2 on each side. Get x is equal to, and make sure you work this out, 3. Okay. All right. Just like any other equation, we do PEMDAS backwards here, and we need to sub get rid of that subtraction by adding 2 fifths to each side. So I'm going to get 4 fifths x equals 3 fifths and 2 fifths is together 5 fifths, but I'm going to represent that just as 1. Lastly, I've multiplied by a 4 fifths, so I need to divide by 4 fifths on each side. But dividing by a fraction means I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal. So I'm going to say 1 times the reciprocal of 4 fifths, which is 5 fourths. So x is 5 fourths. Since this over here is canceled out completely, I just get 5 fourths, or you could represent it as 1 and 1 fourth. All right, just a couple more here. We need to do some simplification. So I look at the numerator and I see nothing that can be combined together. I have just 8, A, B, and C here with their own exponents. And then on the bottom, nothing also can be combined within the denominator. Now I can look um, kind of up and down. So I look at 8 and 10 since those are similar. 8 and 10 can simplify to 4 over 5. And then I look at my A's. I have 3 in the numerator and 5 in the denominator. So if I were to write that out, a, a, and a, 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 that means three pairs get to cancel out and two are left on the bottom as a squared. You could also subtract these, a to the third minus five, get a to the negative second, but that would have to go down to the denominator since it's a negative exponent. All right, so we dealt with those two. Our b's. This is a little funky, but since they're both negative exponents, I need to flip where they are. This b to the negative second needs to go down, b to the negative first needs to go up. Then I'll be dealing just with positive exponents, which we'll do in just a second. So I get b to the first and b to the second. Now positive since we swapped over the fraction bar. And then c to the fourth over c, I have one down here and I can cross it out with one up here, so I have left a c to the third. But I'm not quite done because I have b's in both the numerator and denominator. So I can cancel out one of them here with one of them down here. And so I end up with 4c to the third over 5a squared b. Okay? And now we can say this is fully simplified in this form right here since uh, there's nothing in common between numerator and denominator. It's fully simplified. All right. This one, we just need to combine like terms. I see a like term right here with a squared. If I have four over here and one over here, I would say that I have five total a squareds. a squared, it's not gonna change to a to the fourth because we're not multiplying, we're just adding them up. And then I see 
a minus a and a plus a. Those are like terms, but they actually cancel out. Now remember, with like terms, I'm looking for the same variable with the same exponent. That's why we put together the a squareds and we put together the a's. And this is actually my final answer since those minus a and plus a cancel out. All right, just two more. And when I look at this one, I have to remember PEMDAS. I have to remember that I need to do the exponents first, which means I need to deal with this negative three to the third power. When I do that, I have negative four minus a negative 27. I'll do that piece first. And then I can actually just subtract, but I see I'm subtracting a negative, which means that I need to add the opposite. Negative four plus 27, that's like losing four points and then gaining 27. So I get 23 as my final answer. Gotta do those exponents first. All right, and last one. Lots of ways to go about this. You could multiply these two radicals together first, or you could go ahead and put them in their prime factorization. That's what I would do. And I would say the square root of eight is two times two times two, going from my factor tree of four and two with two and two. And then 125 is actually five times five times five, and you can check that out. And then I can combine them since we're multiplying all of these twos and all of these fives are really in one radical since I'm multiplying the two square roots. And we can circle and pop our pairs. I have a pair of twos and a pair of fives. When I circle and pop them, I have one two now on the outside, a five on the outside, with a two and a five left on the inside. And I can just simplify to get 10 root 10. Remember that when we circle and pop, if I have two on the inside, I pop them out and have just one on the outside since we're finding that square root. And we get our final answer of 10 root 10 for that last one. All right, well, I hope this helps you study for your test 17. Good luck.